so we're going to talk about the Big Bang tonight and cosmology in general. So, um, cosmology, if uh, for the uninformed, uh, is uh, the study of the cosmos. Cosmologist or uh, the studies of cosmology attempts to answer the big questions about the physical nature of the universe, but also its origin. Cosmologists, astronomers have uh, long debated uh, the nature of the, of the universe itself, whether the universe is infinite or finite, whether it is eternal or did it have a beginning, whether it is bounded or unbounded. Is there a boundary to the universe? These are uh, the questions that cosmologists ask and have been trying to answer since we've been able to uh, look out into the cosmos. Various cosmological models have been developed over the years. This is a first century Greek cosmological model that shows the cosmos as a, a geocentered system, meaning with the earth at the very center. A geocentric universe was, has been long held. And this specific cosmological model shows, if you look closely, shows the four basic substances, that is earth, water, air, and fire at the very center. These are the four basic substances of which all things were thought to consist. Surrounding those, if you look closely, you can see the moon, Luna, shown there. Beyond that is Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the starry firmament beyond that. Ultimately, cosmology, like many other areas of science, is an attempt to answer the big question, the one big question. In his book, a Brief History of Time, the well-known British physicist Stephen Hawking identifies the ultimate question behind, behind everything. He said in his book, today we still yearn to know why we are here and where we came from. In the last chapter of, the, of his book, he says, we find ourselves in a bewildering world. We want to make sense of what we see around us and to ask, what is the nature of the universe? What is our place in it and where did it and we come from? Why is it the way it is? Hawkins concedes that the, ult, that the important questions of why the universe exists cannot be answered by means of equations and theories. He continues, even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes the universe for them to describe. The Big Bang cosmology that we're going to discuss is much like biological evolution it is an attempt to explain how the universe came to exist through purely natural processes. We have to keep this in mind. Okay? It's important to keep in mind that what science is teaching today is, a, is an interpretation of our world that stems from atheism. Now, not all scientists are atheists. But the science that's being taught in our public schools, the science that's being taught in our popular media is definitely an interpretation of scientific findings from, that stems from atheism. The scientific community today is uh, dedicated to naturalism, to explaining how the universe came to exist, how our world came to exist, how life on earth and us came to exist through purely natural processes. But if the Bible is correct, we live in a world with a supernatural history, and I argue that it's impossible for a naturalist to correctly understand a world with a supernatural history. But that is what the scientific community is trying to do, and we have to keep that in mind. I encourage people, my students at, uh, here at Cedar Park Christian School and uh, when I teach at Northwest University, I encourage them to be very skeptical about what science is teaching today, in particular with regard to ancient earth history and origins. We have to remember that what they're teaching today is not facts, but they are interpretations of scientific findings. They're merely interpretations. And if we want to know the truth, if we want to know the true history of the world, it is important that we interpret scientific findings ourselves consistent with the biblical worldview. We don't allow an atheist to interpret scientific findings, an atheist to interpret our world and assume that their theories are going to be correct. Because if you start with, an ins, uh, with a flawed worldview, if you, st if, you, if you start with flawed axioms, science is very axiomatic. Interpretations are based on your axioms, your presuppositions, your worldview. If a person starts with a flawed axiom, 
their interpretations are going to be flawed. Their theories are going to be flawed. We should assume that's, that that's the case. Instead, we should interpret scientific findings ourselves consistent with the biblical worldview. The Big Bang. In the beginning, there was nothing. A vacuum, void, empty space. And in this empty space, there emerged a primordial fireball. Billions of years ago, this fireball exploded. This explosion generated all space, energy, matter. The universe expanded rapidly, producing electrons, neutrinos, photons, and quarks. Soon, this energy began interacting, forming protons and neutrons. Matter continued colliding and interacting. Over time, the first simple elements formed. These elements also collided as the primordial soup continued to expand. Cosmic and particulate evolution continued, and stars began to group forming into the earliest galaxies. And then, just five billion years ago, something wondrous occurred. Within a cloud of gas in a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, our sun formed. This new star gave birth to planets, moons, and asteroids. One of these planets, known as Earth, developed an atmosphere. Earth's environment, believed to be filled with volcanic eruptions, lightning, turbulent weather, mixed atoms and energy to create the first simple living cells. and natural selection, algae, jellyfish, and flatworms appeared. As evolution continued, fish appeared in the seas on planet Earth. Some of these fish developed into amphibians and through natural selection changed into reptiles. A segment of these reptiles evolved into a variety of creatures, including mammals. Some of these mammals became primates, and then, just 600,000 years ago, an isolated group of these primates evolved into man's earliest ancestors. This is our amazing evolutionary heritage, and evolution continues today as we evolve to our even higher destiny in the universe. Thus is the view of the naturalistic science that we're being taught today. The term Big Bang was coined by the astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle shown here, in a 1950 BBC radio series called The Nature of the Universe. Hoyle mockingly called this idea the Big Bang, considering it himself preposterous. At the time, most astronomers held to a universe that was eternal. To propose that the universe had a beginning was a little scary to many, as it sounded much like a creation event. Despite the fact that the uh, term was mockingly used, it, it, it caught on. The, not only the, uh, the, not the, the theory itself, but the derisive term became mainstream. You know, not only within astronomy, not only within the scientific community, but also in, uh, in society as well, in popular media, you see it everywhere. State that nearly 14 billion years ago expansion started way the earth began to cool the autotrophs began to grow the end with all developed tools we built a wall we built the pyramids math science history unraveling the mystery it all started with a big bang 
Boyle himself readily saw through the fallacious assumptions behind the Big Bang Theory. And in 1994, he wrote that Big Bang cosmology refers to an epic that cannot be reached by any form of astronomy, and in more than two decades, it has not produced a single successful prediction. In 2004, an open letter to the scientific community was published in New Scientist magazine that was signed by 229 scientists. The signatories of this letter affirmed that an open exchange of ideas is not intolerated as far as the Big Bang is concerned. That the Big Bang today relies upon a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that have never been observed. The Big Bang theory cannot survive without a great many fudge factors. They said in, in no other field of physics would this continual recourse to new hypothetical objects be accepted. And that the Big Bang can boast of no quantitative predictions that have been validated by observation. The, the Big Bang has never been without its critics. The Handy Space Answers book sums up the Big Bang this way. They say, 15 to 20 billion years ago, a Big Bang or explosion occurred, creating the universe. The universe began as an infinitely dense, hot fireball, a scrambling of space and time. This infinitely dense, hot fireball which is known as the singularity, is said to have undergone a quantum fluctuation, resulting in a rapid inflation event and expansion of both space and time. Since, based on Einstein, space and time are interconnected, referred to today as just space-time. The basis for the Big Bang Theory, ultimately, the, meaning the expansion of the universe, expansion of all matter from a single point is due to an observation that has been interpreted as 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 a illustrating outward motion or expansion of galaxies so they have observed they've made observations that they interpret to illustrate the outward expansion of objects in the universe and if we go backwards in time if the universe is expanding now and you think this backwards in time, that means that all of the matter in the universe must have been dense, much more dense in the past. At some point in the past, the entire, entire universe would have been a single point of highly dense matter. So the ultimate evidence to support the Big Bang is an interpretation of observations that indicates that matter today in the universe has expanded or is in the process of expansion. Paul Davies, the physicist and evolutionist, in his book, The Edge of Infinity, describes the Big Bang this way. He says, the Big Bang represents the in instantaneous suspension of physical laws. It is the sudden, abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle. It seems to be a, like a creation event. Even physicists describe it as being something like a miracle. Should we be accepting the Big Bang? Is the Big Bang itself compatible with the Bible? This is one of the big questions we want to consider. <clears throat> and it is noteworthy that 17 times in the Bible, the Bible declares that God stretched out the heavens. 17 times in the Bible, it describes, describes God having stretched out the heavens. The word that is used, the Hebrew word used, is the word that is used to describe how a, a baker stretches out a, uh, a loaf of dough when making bread. 17 times. For example, in the prophetic books, Isaiah, this is what God the Lord says, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spreads out the earth and all that comes on it, who gives breath to its people and life to all who walk on it. Also, Isaiah 45, it is I who made the earth and created mankind upon it. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts. And Jeremiah, he made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens. Seems consistent with a expanding universe. However, we encounter serious difficulties in trying to reconcile these two views if we take the creation account in Genesis to be historical. 
According to Big Bang cosmology, after this inflation event, after this initial expansion, there would have been a dark ages for hundreds of millions of years before the first star evolved. Dark ages for hundreds of millions of years. And only after billions of years of star births and star deaths through supernovas would, enough, uh, would there have been enough heavy elements to start forming dust particles, which would accrete into rocks, which would accrete into asteroids, eventually planets. After only billions of years, would you have had planets? This scenario, this Big Bang scenario, is in stark contrast to the creation account. In, in the creation account, all of the, the sun, moon, and stars weren't created until day four. After the earth was created, covered by water, separated the waters below from the waters above, creating the atmosphere, caused dry land to appear, created the plants. Sun and moon and stars weren't created until the earth was formed with both dry land and plants. On the fourth day of creation, all of the astronomical bodies were created. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Evening and morning, the fourth day. But those aren't the only inconsistencies between these two scenarios, between the Big Bang scenario and the biblical creation order of events. There are other significant problems. For example, uh, both flying creatures and sea creatures are said to have been created before land animals in the Bible, but both birds and your whales, according to biological evolution, evolved from land animals. There are other problems. Plants are said to have evolved much very, very late. Whereas in the Bible, plants were created first. Before all animals, plants were created. Significant problems exist with trying to reconcile these two events. <clears throat> there are several observations supporting the Big Bang. Uh, most notably, they are what is referred to as redshift, and cosmic background radiation. So we want to look at each of these beginning with redshift. Now redshift is a physical phenomenon similar to what is called the Doppler effect. Um, we've all experienced the Doppler effect, which uh, uh, when objects are moving towards us, the waves, the, both sound and light waves are affected by the motion of objects. going is the Doppler effect. <laughs> no, it's not. If I have to, I can demonstrate. Meow. <laughs> All right. So uh, the a Doppler effect is, uh, is seen. W so remember that uh, both light and sound exist as par wave particles, particles that are in waves. And when an object moves, is moving towards you, the waves are compressed, the frequency increases, and the pitch of the sound goes up. So think about when an object moves towards you, if it was the, it blaring its horn or just the sound of the vehicle, oh, the, it, the pitch changes because the, the waves are compressed as an object is moving towards you. And when the wave is compressed, the frequency is, changes as does the pitch in the case of sound. Redshift is similar and redshift stands as a the main observation that convinced astronomers that the universe must have expanded or be in the process of expansion. So I want to make sure we understand this. Okay, light is itself, all of the various colors of light are due to photons that have different wavelengths. Okay, these are wave-like particles. The difference in the length of the wave determines the various colors that we see there in the visible spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, if a, if a light source was traveling towards you, just like sound would be compressed, the light waves themselves would be compressed. And they would change, shift, 
towards the blue end of the spectrum. The blue end of the spectrum has shorter wavelengths. The red end of the light spectrum has longer wavelengths. So if an object is moving towards you, if a light source was moving towards you, the light that is traveling at you would be compressed and would, would shift towards the blue end of the spectrum. Conversely, light that is moving away from you, if a source of light was moving away from the observer, the wavelength would stretch and the light would be shifted more towards the red end of the spectrum. This is what they call redshift. Okay, the biggest difference between um, the Doppler effect and redshift in the universe is, is it believed that, uh, that instead of the objects that we're seeing in the universe moving, space between the two objects is expanding. Okay, but the principle is bas basically the same. And uh, the observation of redshift was first made by Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble, we know of the Hubble Space Telescope. Edwin Hubble contributed greatly to, tr to the field of astronomy in the 1920s and 1930s. He ex greatly expanded uh, our knowledge of uh, stellar distances. And using the newly built 100-inch telescope you see here at the Wilson Observatory, he helped establish that objects like the Andromeda Galaxy, which was previously believed to be a spiral nebula in our own galaxy, that this object was actually a galaxy itself, a great distance from our own. Andromeda, shown here. Andromeda is 2.5 million light years away. and is believed to contain one trillion stars. This is one of the newest images of Andromeda that's been released by NASA. As you zoom further and further into Andromeda, you get a sense of just how many stars there are in that one galaxy. Hubble himself initially derived an, an inaccurate distance to Andromeda of 930,000 light years, we know today, or the estimate today, is that it's closer to 2.5 million light years. Andromeda is the nearest large spiral galaxy to our own. Edwin Hubble also contributed greatly to the cataloging of distinct types of galaxies, including elliptical, spiral, barred, and irregular shaped galaxies. But he is best known for his assertion that galaxies are moving away from us, outward, in expanding space and that their speed is proportional to their distance. This is what is known as the Hubble Law. He proposed this in a 1929 paper that argued for the, what's, what was known as the Law of Redshift, what is now known as the Hubble Law. This apparent expansion of the universe quickly became one of the chief evidences for the Big Bang. So the view is, uh, when looking at galaxies, what Hubble observed was that the light from some of these, ga these galaxies was redshifted, okay? And based on our knowledge of Doppler effects, redshifted light would tell us that the object is moving away from us. And Edwin Hubble interpret this to mean that instead of the object moving away from us, that space was expanding. And... So the more an object is redshifted, the faster it's moving away from us, but the, the only way an object would be moving faster away from us if it was a greater distance from us. Because there would be more space between us and the object, more space to be expanding. So redshift is now used to measure distances. The more redshifted a galaxy is, the greater its distance, the greater its movement, the greater its rate of expansion, and therefore the greater the distance. This is what's known as the Hubble Law. So a galaxy that is blue, if you find a galaxy that is blue shifted, what that means is that the galaxy will be moving towards you. The vast majority of the galaxies, the, the Hubble, one of the Hubble's main observations, was that he found that these galaxies were red shifted, indicating that they were moving away from us. And this was interpreted to mean that the galaxies surrounding us in general are moving away from us, which means that space is expanding. 
So this redshift is used to support the Big Bang expansion of the universe. This was the main observation that convinced astronomers that the universe is expanding. And therefore, if the universe is expanding now, if you go backwards in time, that means it had to have expanded from some original point a long time ago, and thus the Big Bang. This is where we get the Big Bang theory. Redshift is used not only to support the Big Bang expansion, but again, it's also now used to calculate the distance of galaxies. The more redshift an object is, the faster it's moving away from us, and thus the more space is between us and the object, the greater its distance. This is the Hubble law. This is one of Hubble's original diagrams. This is data taken from his original 1929 paper. The dots you see there on the graph are individual galaxies plotted on this graph against its distance and redshift as it was originally calculated. So here's your redshift values on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you see the distance of these galaxies as it was estimated in millions of light years. But I want to point out something. If you'll notice, there are some galaxies below the zero value, meaning down in the blue, shift re blue shifted region. These dots you see here, these galaxies you see here are actually blue shifted. So not all galaxies are red shifted. Some are actually blue shifted. And if their interpretation is correct, that means these galaxies are actually moving towards us. And there are several that are. Andromeda is blue shifted. Andromeda is moving towards us. Most of the galaxies, are what, about 100 galaxies, those, those that are close to us are blue shifted. Many of them are blue shifted. Uh, those in, that, are, that are referred to as being within our own local group are moving towards us. Here's uh, some more recent data that illustrates Hubble law out to even greater distances, in this case, millions of light years. Indeed, the vast majority of galaxies that they have been able to view are redshifted. So, Redshift interpretation, according to Hubble law, states that redshift is roughly proportional to the distance of galaxies. The more redshifted a galaxy is, the greater its distance because the greater its rate of movement away from us. Therefore, based on this interpretation, the universe must be billions of years old since galaxy, galaxies are seen at these great distances, distances that are be, be, believed to be billions of light years away. So is the universe really expanding? Perhaps. Don DeYoung, who is the president of the Creation Research Society and who spoke at our creation conference this past October, said that in the creation view, universe expansion may well be a reality, but the Big Bang interpretation is entirely unnecessary. Instead, the universe was most likely created in an expanding mode for stability. Without expansion, gravity would cause the universe to begin to collapse back on itself. Many other motions, he says, like the orbits of planets and the rotation of stars and galaxies also serve the same function of providing a stable, dependable universe. So is it expanding? Perhaps. Is their interpretation of redshift correct? Perhaps. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that there was a big bang. Could be that that is just how God created in the beginning, expanding. In recent years, galaxy redshift surveys have revealed something about the distribution of galaxies that not only challenges what is called the Copernican principle or cosmological principle, but argues for a galactocentric universe, meaning a universe where we are, where our galaxy is at the center. Uh, the Copernican principle, you'll hear, re, you'll hear people refer to the Copernican principle, was based, uh, it's called that because Copernicus was the first person that devised a heliocentric solar system. The original cosmological models placed the Earth at the center of the solar system. Copernicus was the first one that placed the Sun at the center of the solar system. And so the Copernic, Copernicus her Copernican principle holds that the Earth is not at the center. The cosmological principle is basically an extension of the Copernican principle that extends to the whole universe. Not only is the Earth not at the center of the universe, but it does not occupy a special place in the universe at all. And observations from the Earth 
can be taken to be broadly characteristic of what would be seen from any point in the universe. In fact, they would argue there is no center of the universe at all. On the largest scale, matter is assumed to be uniformly distributed throughout the universe. It's what's called homogeneity. The universe, based on the cosmological principle, based on Big Bang cosmology, is believed to be homogeneous. Homogeneity is the rule. Throughout the whole universe, matter is assumed to be universe uniformly distributed. And in every direction we look, we should see the same distribution of galaxies, what is called isotropy. The extension of that notion is that the universe has no center and no edge. There is no privileged place and the earth is just positioned at some random location within space. If the Big Bang is true, then there is a most troubling implication of that. That is that the earth is not special at all. In fact, that the authority of scripture is also in doubt. That science is needed to understand scripture. Since the Bible says that the earth was created with both dry land and plants before the any astronomical body was created, apparently we need science to really help us interpret what these days of creation really were. And 2,000 years of incorrect biblical interpretation have taken place. As I mentioned, analysis of redshift have, have challenged the cosmological principle, this principle of homogeneity, that matter should be evenly distributed throughout the universe, has been challenged by redshift observation. If the universe was truly homogeneous, then we would expect to find galaxies randomly distributed throughout the universe. We would expect to find galaxies with red shifts at basically every possible location along the electromagnetic spectrum, along the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. But instead, what we find are that red shifts are quantized. They tend to exist at very specific, certain and very specific quantities. If galaxies are randomly distributed throughout the universe, we should find galaxies at every possible distance from us. But we don't find that. We find that, that galaxies seem to have very, very specific redshifts that differ about one million light years from each other. So you got a whole bunch of galaxies one million light years away, another whole bunch of galaxies at two million light years away. It's very bizarre. In 1984, Tift at the Stewart Observatory in Tucson, Arizona, examined red shifts of galaxies and found what he referred to as sharp periodicities at exact submultiples. He said there is now very firm evidence that red shift galaxies are quantized. They tend to be found, red shifts tend to be found at specific quantities. However, there was much skepticism about their findings. <clears throat> For decades, despite the fact that TIFF continued to produce peer-reviewed publications closing all the loopholes in his case. In 1994, Russell Humphreys published Starlight and Time in which he stated the quantized distribution of galactic redshifts observed by various astronomers seems to contradict the Copernican principle and all cosmologies founded on it, including the Big Bang. In 1997, an independent study of 250 galaxy redshifts was performed by William Napier that confirmed TIFF's observations. He said the redshift distribution has been found to be strongly quantized in a galactocentric frame of reference, meaning these quantized redshifts indicate that our galaxy seems to be at the center of these galaxies. What does this mean? Galaxies are commonly found at certain distances from the Earth in all directions. And it appears from these quantized redshift values that we are at the center of shells of galaxies that are about a million light years apart. In 2002 issue of the Journal of Creation, Russell Humphreys summarized the implications of these findings that support quantized redshifts. He says, Astronomers have confirmed that numerical values of galaxy redshifts are quantized, tending to fall into distinct groups. According to Hubble's law, redshifts are proportional to the distance of galaxies from us. Then it would be the distances themselves that fall into groups. 
that would mean that galaxies tend to be grouped into conceptual spherical shells concentric around our own galaxy the milky way interesting but what if we these kind of values are seen from any location in the universe so russell humphreys tested this to see if these redshift values were neat, unique to our own position this is some data showing the number of galaxies that are present at various redshifts so a number of this number of galaxies can be found with this redshift value indicating this distance from the earth and this many galaxies can be found at that with that redshift or distance from the earth we can see these what russell humphreys did to test this was he mathematically shifted the position of the earth and when the position of the earth was shifted by more than a million light years what happened was that these distant group groupings disappeared these distant group groupings appear to be seen only from our vantage point from any other position in the universe they overlap one another and become indistinguishable interesting nasa recently released this new map of the galaxies revealing that indeed the galaxies are not randomly distributed in the universe the universe is not homogeneous a striking feature can be seen in this image the lack of homogeneity in particular remember that is asserted by the cosmological principle the galaxies are gravitationally bound to form clusters which themselves are loosely bound into superclusters which in turn seem to be aligned onto larger scale structures there is a fabric to the universe that these galaxies seem to be bound to the sloan digital sky survey is a spectroscopic redshift survey telescope at apache point observatory in new mexico recently the sloan digital sky survey produced measurements of galactic structures and redshifts of more than 1 billion light years across and mapped about 200,000 galaxies in about 60% of the night sky. And later this was extended to even one, more than 1 million galaxies. This is one of the images produced by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Image of galaxies and their redshifts from the Earth. You'll notice the distribution of galaxies from the Earth. If I transpose over this image the redshift values of 0.0246, you then see what, is, what has been revealed by these redshift values. That at certain distances from the Earth, you see concentrations of galaxies. The data shows not only concentric but also circular structures centered near our galaxy in the center more clearly than any earlier maps were produced what we see is what is called a cosmic web a series of voids and connected filaments but also we see a general concentric structure of galaxies which tends to lie on circles spaced at equal distances what is called equidistant from the center where the earth is located look at this image this is particularly obvious to the human eye on the left hand side of that diagram in these maps the galaxy density seems to oscillate it decreases and then increases periodically with distance hence the circular structures that were seen this spatial galaxy density variation can result from the fact that galaxies are preferentially found at certain discrete distances John Hartnett has a PhD in physics from the University of Western Australia. He has published more than 200 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals and is associate professor at the University of Adelaide in Australia. In the 2004 issue of the Journal of Creation, he states that newly published data from the Sloan Digital Survey laid by Max Telmark of the University of Pennsylvania shows that our galaxy is centered our galaxy is centered on a great concentric distribution of galaxies he continues if this map is correct the evidence seems to suggest that the so-called cosmological principle 
upon which all of Big Bang is cosmology is based is wrong. Another main piece of evidence or observation interpreted in, support, in support of the Big Bang is what is referred to as cosmic background radiation. This is one of the alleged proofs of the Big Bang model of origins. The cosmic radiation shown here is detected by special satellites. This, one, this image was produced by what is called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. The image shown here shows temperature variations in space that were captured by this satellite. The hot regions, the red regions in the center are from our galaxy, but they differ from the blue regions from surrounding space by only 0 0.0002 degrees Kelvin. So the red center is only 0 0.002 degrees Kelvin hotter than the cold blue regions. Nonetheless, when the galaxy portion is removed, this image is generated. Shortly after being discovered in 1964, this background radiation that was quickly claimed to be the afterglow of the original Big Bang. It is argued that since radiation was emitted from the Big Bang, it then cooled to much longer wavelengths, stretched from the infrared to the microwave portion of the spectrum. This image here was created by NASA to illustrate the use of the WAMAP satellite, the Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe, to detect the cosmic background radiation and the interpretation of this radiation in support of big, the Big Bang explosion. However, there are a number of problems with this interpretation of cosmic background radiation, such as mi the missing cosmic shadows. The, the radiation from the Big Bang fireball should cast shadows in the foreground of all galaxy clusters. According to the Big Bang theory, the energy from this Big Bang explosion should be the most distant energy source from us. Thus, the galaxy clusters would be in the foreground of the source of this radiation, of this cosmic background radiation. And this radiation must pass through these galaxy clusters to reach us. When this happens, the path of the cosmic background radiation is interrupted, should be interrupted and distorted, producing shadows. In 2006, it was reported in the Astrophysical Journal that the expected shadowing was not found. The study looked for a shadow in the cosmic background radiation in the foreground of 31 galaxy clusters and concluded that on average, no systematic shadows were detected. In fact, the authors question, uh, the, uh, the questions were asked by the authors, why are the clusters so relatively hot? Is there, they also asked, is there an additional source of the emission that cancels out the expected shadow? A team of scientists at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, led by Dr. Liu, used data from the WAMAP satellite to scan the cosmic background for shadows, specifically for shadows. And remember, the WAMAP satellite was specifically designed to detect this cosmic background radiation. Uh, Liu, Liu concluded, having not found the, uh, the, the, the uh, cosmic uh, shadows, Liu concluded that either it, he says, the microwave background isn't coming from behind the clusters, meaning from the Big Bang, which means that the Big Bang is bl blown away, or else there is something else going on. One possibility, he says, is to say that the clusters themselves are, are microwave-emitting sources. So this cosmic background radiation, this microwave background radiation, appears to not be coming from some distant source from this Big Bang explosion. We find it in front of galaxies that should be filtering out this, uh, this radiation. Instead, at least this researcher concluded that it's very possible that this microwave radiation is coming from these galaxy clusters themselves. 
Redshift has also been challenged by measurements of what are referred to as quasars. Quasars, the name quasars, for the older people, you might, might remember the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 appliance manufacturer that was called Quasar. Quasar, you remember Quasar? The word is better pronounced in Quasar. Quasar stands for quasi-stellar objects. And quasars are very peculiar objects that radiate as much energy per second as a thousand or more galaxies, but a quasar is about one millionth the size of a galaxy. So they're these, they're the quasar, the name quasar means quasi-stellar objects. So they're very, very, very dense, but very bright, very energy producing objects, but very, very small. And they have enormous redshifts. Based on the in their high redshift values, they should be at the very edge of the visible galaxy. And they've always been concluded to be that. Once they discovered quasars and the redshift values, they, they assumed based on these redshift values, they were the very edge of the visible universe. However, quasars are challenging this interpretation in that many quasars have been found associated with galaxies that don't have redshift values anywhere near that. The galaxy in the center of this picture appears to be physically connected to the quasar that you see in the lower left. Disagreements about such systems have raged for decades as it challenges the Hubble law. The, again, that redshift, the redshift foundations of modern cosmology and how it relates to expansion and distance. Some believe that the quasar you see here, Mark, Mark Arian 205, was recently ejected from this galaxy. But there are other examples that appear irrefutable. Here's another picture showing the same galaxy taking with, uh, I believe, it infrared, showing what appears to be a connection between this galaxy and the quasar that's beneath it. There are other examples that seem irrefutable. Many contested uh, the, the galaxy that, and the quasar that I just showed you, but there are others that seem irrefutable. For example, there's a quasar found in the famous Stevens Quintet. This is a set of five galaxies at three, that are believed to be 300 million, light, 300 million light years away. The famous photo called Stevens Quintet. In the galaxy to the upper left, there is a quasar. I'll zoom in on this galaxy for you so you can see the location of the quasar right there. Now from this image, it's pretty much clear that that quasar is in front of the galaxy. Because of the density of the galaxy behind it, that quasar being seen from behind it is just not possible. The problem is that the redshift value of the galaxy is much much smaller than the quasar. The redshift of the galaxy itself is 0 0.0225. The closer, the quasar that's closer to us has a much larger redshift of 2.11. 2.11, that's about 100 times larger of a redshift. But since the quasar has 100 times larger redshift in the galaxy, it must be receding about 100 times faster from us, if their interpretation of redshift is correct, uh, uh, faster, and that means it's about 30 times further away than the galaxy. It should be. But there it is, lying in front of a galaxy that it should be 30 times further away from. And in this view, in this higher magnification image, of the quasar, you can see what appears to be a jet of matter extending out of the center of the galaxy, NGC 7319. A, a stream of matter seems to be extending toward the quasar. But again, according to the Hubble law, the conventional interpretation of redshift, this observation of a quasar between a galaxy and the Earth is just not possible because its redshift means it should be 30 times further away than the galaxy. Halton Arp is one of the key actors in our cosmological debate here about origins uh, of and evolution of galaxies in the universe. 
Um, he was a staff astronomer at Mount, at Mount Wilson and Palomar Observatories in California for 29 years. Earlier in his career, he was Edwin Hubble's assistant. So he was assistant of Edwin Hubble. He earned the Helen B. Warner Prize, the Newcomb Cleveland Award, and the Alexander von Humboldt Senior Scientist Award. He is his, perhaps best known for a landmark compilation of peculiar galaxies that he created. Uh, galaxies that were associated with quasars led him to challenge the fundamental assumption of modern cosmology, the Hubble Law. That redshift is a uniform indicator of distance and proof of expansion. ARP, in fact, argues that quasars themselves might be ejected proto-galaxies. What, what are seen frequently are quasars next to galaxies, and several scientists, including Ar uh, uh, ARP, have argued that these might be proto-galaxies, galaxies that have been ejected, or objects that have been ejected from other galaxies. And that instead, the red shift is intrinsic. It's not due to expansion or movement, but it's intrinsic and may decrease with age. He also validates the quantization of red shifts, that they imply a galactocentric model of the universe. He said the fact that measured values of red shift do not vary continuously, but come in steps certain preferred values is so unexpected that, the, that conventional astronomy has never been able to accept it in spite of the overwhelming evidence. He continues, for supposed, re supposed recession velocities of quasars to measure equal steps in all directions in the sky means we are at the center of a series of explosions. This is an anti-Copernican embarrassment. One other very cool thing I wanted to point out to you. In 2014, the European Southern Observatory in Chile reported additional observations that quasars, about quasars that dramatically challenge the cosmological principle of homogeneity. Observations from the European Southern Observatory's telescope, which is called the Very Large Telescope, they got a telescope called the Very Large Telescope, which is actually a set of like five different telescopes seen there, but Very Large Telescope. Maybe it loses, loses something in translation, I don't know. Called the Very Large Telescope. What they discovered was that uh, the axis of quasars are aligned along these cosmological filaments that seem to be binding galaxies together. Watch this animation. This shows the structure of the universe, these galaxies as they're displayed in, again, non-random manner. Galaxies are not just randomly distributed. They're gravitationally bound, forming these larger scale structures. The quasars that are found there near the galaxies have an axis that appears to be aligned. I'll zoom in on this so you can see this a little better. Zoom in so you can see a little better what we're talking about there. This alignment of these quasars axis comes as confirmation of something that had already been noted with galaxies closer to us in space. In 2001, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey found that the spin axis of these closer galaxies were found to be aligned. The alignment of galaxy axis came as a shock at the time since it is difficult to account for, the fact, for this fact based on the standard cosmological model. The, this cosmological principle of homogeneity that is so uh, pervasive in, si in uh, astronomy thinking today. However, the most recent development of quasar axis alignments that was uh, discovered by the European Southern Observatory not only re reinforces these earlier findings, but also shows that it appears to be a cosmos-wide phenomenon. The universe, ladies and gentlemen, is not homogeneous. God has created an extraordinary tapestry of stars and galaxies that are interconnected into remarkable tapestry that see seems beyond our comprehension. As we continue to learn more about God's creation, we have become aware that it is far more complex and intricate than anyone of Darwin's day could have imagined. 
there is an estimated 100 billion galaxies in the universe with approximately 100 billion stars each. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Much like we've realized that the cell is complex beyond imagination. At this point, we're just now understanding how complex the cell is. Back in Darwin's day, they viewed the cell as a shapeless little lump of mucus or slime. Now we know it's this amazingly complex construct. As we continue to learn more about the cosmos, we're realizing that it is itself this amazingly complex construct. It's not a random distribution of matter, homogeneous matter throughout the universe, homogeneity, it is not. A remarkable tapestry has been woven by God to declare his own glory. Let me close this out in a word of prayer. Father, we uh, thank you so much. Humbled uh, when we consider the vastness of the cosmos that you have made, Father, just how big our God is. When we consider the universe that surrounds us, Father, what a wonderful God you are. Truly the universe declares your glory and your righteousness, Father. Father, we are humbled to know that the God that spoke the universe into existence, the God that made this wonderful world, loved us so much to prepare this place for us, Father. But that you loved us so much to watch over us. You love us, love us so much to, that you hear our prayers. That you love us so much that you sent your son to die for us. Father, we praise you. We praise your name, Hashem. Praise the name of the Lord God. Father, we love you so much. Father, we ask for wisdom. Father, we ask for opportunities to serve. Send people to, to us who need to hear the words that we have to say. Give us wisdom to be able to testify to those that are around us. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We ask all things in Christ's name. Amen.